Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. We're going to hopscotch from local to national to international affairs with my guest, an old friend, Les Payne, a Pulitzer Prize winning former reporter, columnist, and editor with Newsday. Among other things, we'll talk about the mistaken arrest in Midtown Manhattan of the former tennis star, James Blake, and the wild and wacky presidential election, which has been unlike any that I've ever seen before, at least so far. And finally, the nuclear deal negotiated by the Obama administration in Iran. So let's get started. Les, welcome. Great. Thanks for Thank coming you, in. Good, really appreciate it. Good to be here again. So uh, we'll begin with the James Blake story. Uh, Blake is the former uh, tennis star um, who was arrested outside Grand Central Terminal, actually slammed to the ground, mm -hmm. handcuffed, and arrested in the case of mistaken identity. He was identified, I guess, by an, a police informant. Right. These were undercover cops. Blake said they did not announce that they that the guy that grabbed him did not announce that he was a police officer, and so there's been a big to do about the whole thing. Uh, what were, what was your first reaction when you heard that story? Well, that I've heard that story before, and that is that uh, when we saw it on, on video, and, and he was particularly uh, non-resistant, as it were. In fact, right. he said, I didn't hear him, but he, he said, and I believe him, that he said, I'm going to 100% cooperate. Right. Nonetheless, he was slammed to the ground, taken out. And I think that uh, when I say it's, it's, it, it reminds me of, of, of the stories that are running now because of cell phones, you know, that are that are recording them visually, is that uh, we've had all the cases with Eric Garner, Michael Brown, right. uh, Tamir Rice out in Cleveland. And on the one hand, each of these cases are different, uh, but when you put them together, they add up to a quite disturbing pattern. Uh, race is involved because the targets invariably are blacks. Although uh, with, with Blake, he said he's, uh, he's he's he classifies himself as mixed race, which I suppose. Obama could say that as well. He has a white right. mother and, and, and a black father. And I guess he was trying to say that, therefore, they may not have been able to tell him. But I looked at him, and I think we all know Absolutely. that he was black. I'm sure that cop knew and took him to be an African-American, whether yep. he believes it or not. Well, they so, were looking for an African-American, and they decided that he was the guy. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Well, but, you know, the, the, the first one, the, the Brit that they arrested for, who pointed him out, by the way, was a Brit and white. And he, by the way, was not slammed to the ground and handcuffed. <laughs> right. Thank you very exactly. much. And the second one, who turned out to be a Brit, you know, uh, was not slammed to the ground. You know, thank right. you very much. Uh, so I think that when you look at these patterns, I mean, the thing that's disturbing about it uh, is that each one is different. But, you know, what, what they say, you know, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter, you know, which came into existence after Trayvon Martin's uh, killer, George Zimmerman uh, uh, was acquitted. Then they came and said, wait a minute, we, we have to do something about this. And, and, and the movement, uh, Black Lives Matter, look at all of these cases and you look at the pattern. In, 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 in Texas, you know, what is the behavior for the African-American when confronting the police? In Texas, you can't smoke a cigarette and God knows stand your ground and, and, and ask your rights. Uh, with uh, Tamir Rice, you can't play with a gun in a park. Uh, in the case of Blake, you can't stand against a building and wait for a limousine to take you to the U.S. Open. <laughs> so what can you? And this right. is in New York City. Exactly. And you can't sell loose cigarettes. And so, and in South Carolina, you can't even run away no. from the cop, mm -mm. you know, who shot him in the back eight, eight times. So in, I think in, that... In, in a case of a very minor uh, alleged offense. Yeah. But, okay, that's nationally. But in New York City, NYPD, yep. something has got to be done. Blake was arrested in New York City, Eric Garner in New York City, uh, Staten Island. And yet we have the police commissioner presently, you know, who's kind of half-stepping on it, and uh, Kelly, who's full-stepping on it, you right. know, uh, and, and uh, the, the uh, PBA uh, commissioner, God knows, he's way over the top. And you mentioned, you know, that the, these uh, most recent examples uh, you have a video because of the ubiquitous cell phones, you know, but you and I have been aware of these uh, these kinds of cases and have covered them going back decades, yeah. so before the era of sure. cell phones. And, of course, the complainants were just always uh, dismissed, or in some cases yeah. th these were f uh, fatalities, um, uh, for example. Yeah. Uh, but nevertheless, in the era of uh, cell phone videos, they continue to happen. Yeah. 
what's the remedy? Why is, is there a reluctance? Yes. Is there a, an unwillingness of uh, mayors and police commissioners to rein in this behavior? That's a key question. I think that when you pull back and you look at historically the big picture of America, I think that you, from the time of the Fugitive Slave Act and towards during slavery, uh, but coming up into the present, I mean, these uh, acts, whether they end in death or injury or just embarrassment in Blake's case, which are done by these police, they are done with the tacit approval of the majority of white America. Right. I have to say that because grand juries meet and they let these cops go. The police have a license to kill, harm, and their pattern is to police in a racially disparate way. That is a problem. The answer is right. how do you get rid of that? I think a number of things has to happen. I think that racial, uh, uh, that, that ra Black Lives Matter is good outside pressure that's put on the, on the I think there has to be uh, concern from the inside, be it the Justice Department or the NYPD. But more specifically, Bob, and this is a thing that I really think that we don't get around to is this, and this really troubles me, is that I think that it is incumbent upon black police officers in the New York Police Department to change that culture, A. B, they are disinclined to do that. And I know because I've met with them. I've even met with the 100 black men in law enforcement Same who here. supposedly right. care. They are disinclined to do it. Now, when you really press them, as I have, both uh, as a reporter and otherwise, they will say, well, blue tops black. Okay. Now, that's the existing uh, acceptance. But it, 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 it would be okay if there was not this disparate racial policing right. because... Uh, and I, I was talking to someone the other day, uh, in fact, an uh, editor whom I won't name, <laughs> <laughs> but a active, engaged editor very much in New York City, and we talked right. about this, this very issue. And, 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 and I cited the fact that turn of the century, it was the Irish who were targeted yep. by the police. They were the outlaw. They were, that's where the disparate policing was. They were the gangsters. They were the outlaws. Well, one thing happened is when the Irish got into the police department in New York City, all right. They changed the culture. Right. Blue did not top no, green. We're, we're not going to target the Irish right. anymore. That's right, because the Irish were running the police department. Right. And even before they run it, they changed the culture. And, and blacks must change it, not to, to be favorably disposed, but no. just to treat them fairly. Right, To treat exactly. you and your sons, daughters, cousins, nephews fairly. That's we're all we're We're not going to unfairly target African Americans. That's right. And we're not going to treat them in a brutal fashion when, when right. it's unnecessary. That's yeah. right. Um, nationally, we've got a presidential election going on, and all I hear when I turn on the television is Trump, 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 yeah. all day, all night. Give me your take on the, well, I, I mean, Trump is, in fact, a phenomenon. Um, for a variety of reasons, he's leading or is near the top in a lot of uh, right. polls. But give me your take on the way the mainstream press has been covering the Donald Trump campaign. Well... I don't want to sound like someone who's no longer in the press and is criticizing the press because <laughs> when I was in there, I had my shot. But I, I would say that one of the things that we used to say, well, I was one of those editors who did not believe in, 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 in the infallibility of polling. Right. You know, and I think that we don't have that critique that we had even four years ago uh, from what's his name, I forget his name, who's critiquing uh, uh, the misreading of polls. So I think, uh, but having said that, He's ahead because of the polls. And, and we used to say all the time that name recognition, name recognition, right. name recognition now. And we seem to have forgotten that phrase. But Trump if, is one of the best known people in the country. I mean, <laughs> exactly. he's been on television every night. He's been acting as a leader, you know, on that. Uh, I don't on watch that show. On The Apprentice. Uh, right. And they see him. They, he's powerful. He's in charge. <laughs> he's an authority. He's an authority figure. He's a manager. He's a leader. He's a decision maker. He's all of this. And they think, apparently, and, and he's popular. So I, th I think that, that people, plus he has name recognition. Right. So he has all of that going for him, you know. But none of that translates into someone who can be the leader of the free world in a time that we are, we're, right. uh, and, and have his finger on the nuclear trigger. It's a, it's I, saw, a dangerous pattern. I saw voters interviewed on television um, saying we think that he would be a great leader of the American military because he does a great job on The Apprentice. Yeah. And, I, you know, I'm looking at the television thinking, oh, my. And he said in his book that, well, when I was in the military school, and he was, he was sent there because right. he was a troubled kid, by the <laughs> right. way. He never went into the military. He got deferment after deferment right. after deferment. Right. So but he was in military him. school. Yeah, so, so it was so like going in the military. It was just, <laughs> what, it was just like it. Uh, you and I were in the military. Yeah. Well, we might beg to differ, but that's, you know... <laughs> 
I but, suppose. But you kind of would hope he would go away. Uh, 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 but but you don't. When you look at the look at the competition, you know, uh, you know, it's. It, I. I have assumed from Jump Street that there was no chance of him getting the Republican so had I. nomination. So had I. Do you still hold to that assumption? Well, I'm, I'm going to, I think we have to wait a little bit to see. I think what we have to see, you know, there's a debate going on and a series of debates going on. I think the, the, the Republican Party now is in the process of, of, of weeding and seeding, as they say, <laughs> right. weeding out, you know, they have 16 candidates, weeding yeah. out these candidates and then begin to seed what they take to be uh, their best crop you know, to put against, uh, best harvest to put against the, d the Democratic nominee. So I think that process is still going on. And, and I'm not really quite sure. I mean, like you, at first I thought that, you know, he would go. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure now. But, but I think that the question is that, you know, the debate, you know, uh, right. uh, uh, recently, uh, you know, you have five uh, former governors, you have three senators, and you have two ir three irregulars, Carson, uh, Florina, and Trump. And so I think that what it so far uh, it seemed to represent, obviously, is that people are uh, not happy with uh, politicians. Right, they're right. not happy with, with sitting politicians, so they're going to the irregulars. Yep. Well, um, but you mentioned the number of uh, Republican candidates, and that's actually another reason why Trump is um, doing so well in the, in the polls. You combine his extraordinary name recognition yeah. with the fact that all he needs is a plurality. In, and in no one knows who these other people yeah, right, are, right. and they can't get yeah. recognition. Yeah. So, yeah. Meanwhile, on the Democratic side, I mean, Hillary Clinton was supposed to be a, a lock for the nomination. Trump was supposed to not have a chance of getting the nomination. Yeah. Hillary was supposed to have been a lock for the nomination, but she's struggling. Um, now, I, I don't know that it's clear um, well, how serious the yeah. trouble is that her candidacy is facing, but what's your take? Again, when you pull back, uh, what strikes me is that when Barack Obama was elected back in 08, uh, I think that he really changed the dynamics. And what he did, he put together, he, uh, uh, Axelrod and his team, right. put together a coalition of African American, Latinos, Asian, young whites, young, and highly right. educated whites. Yep. All right. And they put together this coalition and that got him elected and reelected. All right. Now, the other side of that is that they were up against the overwhelming majority of white voters, all the voters who went to the polls in 2008 and in 2012. For instance, 2012, what that, co that coalition did is, Obama coalition, let's call it, it defeated 60% of all the white voters who went to the poll. Right. All the white voters who went to the poll, they voted 60-40, 59-39 uh, for Mitt Romney a guy they didn't even like. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Mrs. Romney liked him. You know, and, and they were not very enthusiastic right. about him, but I mean, here he was. And so, but, and because they figured, well, you know, he's handsome, maybe he can hoodwink enough voters into, because he looks like a president and kind of walks like a president, although I hope a president would not walk the way Mitt Romney walks, but that's another case. Right. Uh, so I think that the problem, though, is that this coalition, the Obama coalition, would not allow 60% of white voters who went to the poll to decide who was the president. They're terrified. They have right. all kinds of power. That's what Mitt Romney, I mean, Mitch McConnell is about. And so I think that the Democrats are cooper cooperating in this, you know. So what they are doing is they are denying this coalition a candidate. This coalition that uh, Axelrod put together that got Obama elected and reelected, they are denying, the Democrats and the Republicans are denying them a candidate, all right? And so the closest that come, they could, comes to a, con, a candidate is Bernie Sanders. And he appeals to a segment of that coalition, which is, say, right. the, kind of the young whites. Yep. So I think that that's what I think we see going on. Now, in terms of Hillary, Hillary has two problems. One is, yes, she has the email problem. And the other problem is Hillary. For starters, she's not a natural politician. That's right. Um, you know, Bill Clinton is, you know, lives, eats, breathes uh, politics. That's, that's not the case uh, with Hillary, you know, no matter how talented um, she may be. Um, so that's a problem. Also, both Clintons have a problem um, being truthful. Um, so, well, yeah, the po latest polls, so, so, people just so, don't believe So them. they they get uh, caught up in this idea of, you know, that, that they're not really, uh, you can't really trust them the way you might want to trust uh, yeah. a presidential uh, contender. But a big problem for the Democrats is that, um, you, you know, you, you mentioned the, they don't have a candidate to put together this coalition. The Democrats really don't have a very deep bench. 
I mean, well, because they decided not to have one, because they have decided that Hillary is inevitable. In fact, this is what Duval Patrick, who is a two-term governor of Massachusetts, said, that, yeah, he, he accepted the job that Bill Clinton arranged for him at Bain Capital. Because Bill Clinton still has too much authority. I mean, he still <laughs> has great influence with, with Duval Patrick as but one example of a man who, who could have run, in, in my view, people expected to run, two-term governor of Massachusetts, uh, African-American, uh, 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 gave that keynote address at the Democratic uh, uh, Convention. He didn't run. Clinton went to him. Bill Clinton went to him, used his influence, told him that Hillary was inevitable. And this is the pattern that flowed. And so I think her inevitability chilled a lot of uh, potential Democrats. You have O'Malley, right. you know, down in Maryland, you know, who's running. But I think that uh, their people should not have bought into, and there's still time for them not to. In fact, Biden is a possibility. And I think that what, what the issue that Biden speaks to is uh, Obama's legacy. Hillary clearly will not continue his legacy. Biden would come closest. Right, I, I agree. And I also think on the uh, inevitability issue, 2008 should have sh told the Democrats that Hillary is not inevitable. Um, Barack Obama came essentially out of nowhere That's and right. snatched that not snatched The that Times made, made the point today that uh, uh, at this time, in September of 2008, Hillary Clinton was 18 points ahead of this unknown Senator right. Obama, 18 points ahead of him at this time in, in 08. And at the same time, by the way, the people who were ahead was Fred Thompson and Giuliani on the Republican side. <laughs> you Thank go. you very much. You remember who they are now? <laughs> so um, speaking. That's a note for, for, for Trump to pay some attention to, yeah, by I the way. I agree. <laughs> um, speaking of President o Obama, um, this Iran nuclear deal, uh, mm. a big triumph for the uh, oh, yeah. Obama administration, for the president personally. He staked a tremendous amount um, mm. on it. But it, it strikes me that, um, you know, he's, he's secured this deal uh, and it's gotten a lot of attention. But I think a lot of Americans really don't understand that issue very well. So let's do a little bit of a, of a, a primer yeah. here. Um, why is Iran considered such a vital threat? to the United States, and why did the uh, Obama administration feel that achieving this uh, nuclear deal with, with, with Iran was so important? Well, I think it's a history of, of, of stability in the region. Uh, Iran was moving toward developing, it, well, sanctions has been against Iran, they've been suffering tragically. Uh, they had been moving with help toward uh, a giving, I mean, they had 5,000 centrifuges even during the Bush administration right. to build a nuclear weapon. And in that region where stability is a problem, you know, uh, I think that uh, Iran was a threat. Israel obviously is concerned about another nuclear power other than Israel in that immediate region. Uh, and so I think that the U.S. came in on it. But I think in terms of the deal itself, what Obama did, and this is one of the things that uh, this is, you know, you talk about Obamacare, but this is going to be Obama's Iran deal too right. pretty soon. They're going to label it, is that uh, this deal, they, it was said, even uh, Netanyahu went before the U.N., that uh, Iran was uh, months, in, with certainly within a year, of, of getting the, a nuclear weapon. This deal makes it 15 years you know, uh, according to the deal. And it's not just uh, uh, the U.S. I mean, you, you have, chi you have uh, uh, Russia, Germany, France, and England, and the U.S. are on this deal. They're, they're making this agreement. So this is a hugely important deal. And I think that in terms of Israel, I think it makes the point that on this particular issue, the security interests, which is your, your problem of, of, of a superpower, is not that of, of, of a tiny nation surrounded by its enemies, uh, in, in, in that region. And, and so there's been a diversion of interest on this, generally, although there's a lot of, there's a split. You know, there's no right. uniform Israel position because they're, they're, they're right. Israelis who, who, who are in favor of the deal quite, quite, quite strongly. But you have to believe that if, in fact, the deal is effective, it, it, it remains to be seen. But obviously that's beneficial to Israel if, if you, in fact, can prevent Iran from... I think it's beneficial for the U.S. And uh, I know, I'll let... Israel decide for Israel, I mean. <laughs> oh, well, um, you, you know, it, it, the fact of the matter is that Netanyahu um, and Israeli, Israeli interests play a role in, in American politics. So, yeah. um, you know, you, you had Hillary uh, making the comment uh, not too long ago that if she sees uh, uh, any indication that Iran is cheating on this deal, yeah, that she yeah. wouldn't hesitate to yeah, use oh, yeah. military well, um, you know, action. Her position so, is that she will be as vigorous and militaristic even as she can be under the deal, 
whereas most of the Republicans, not Donald Trump, said that they would repeal the deal. Which is uh, impossible. Yeah, like, they're, like they're going <laughs> like to repeal Ob Obamacare. You know? Yes. But this idea of this um, uh, presenting a, a presidential candidate, in this case uh, Hillary, but, but we've seen it so often, um, this idea for political reasons, trying to show just how tough you are, mm -hmm. you know, and that you wouldn't hesitate to use military action and stuff like that. We've seen how dangerous this can be. We, mm -hmm. You know, we look at what's happened in the, in, in the Middle East and, mm -hmm. you know, um, so in any event. So here we have Obama staking his prestige uh, to a great extent on this. Um, he did it something similar um, with o Obamacare. Obamacare so um, uh, he won... Uh, on both of those issues. He's coming to the close of his second term. How's he done? I think he's, he's, he's been as once, he's been a, a uh, consequential, one of the more consequential presidents in recent times. Because when, when you look at it, and, and, and not just remember that the uh, stock market, by the way, was 7,000. Right. When he took over, and I don't know about you, but my 401k, I wouldn't even open it. You know, it would come in your car, I would throw it in the drawer. I wouldn't dare even open up, you know, my IRA to right. look at it. I mean, it was extraordinary. And and even though the market is down, it was seven, it's 15000 now, thank you very much. Not only that, but uh, the, the Lehman Brothers had collapsed. The economy was on the verge of total collapse. There were two wars going on, Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, and, and there were troops dying, American soldiers were dying on right. two fronts. On two fronts. So he's, he's cooled that out. He has, uh, not, not he by himself, but I mean during his, his, his watch, he has saved the economy uh, and the country, essentially. The auto industry was gone. The American auto industry was gone. He saved that. I think that what we need to say, Bush and Cheney uh, and Rumsfeld, you know, brought the country to the brink. Which the and party, brought it back. Which, which their party has not paid a price for, um, which I think is actually uh, extraordinary. If if a Democratic president had had left oh, wow. office with the country in the shape yeah. that it was yeah. in when George W. Bush left the yeah. office, I mean, it, it might have been decades before another Democrat yeah, so it's uh, was, where the was power elected. Is. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, Obama. Um, you know, after he is elected, with um, all of these enormous challenges that you mentioned, uh, has to face also the challenge of absolute lack of cooperation well, that's it. at all from the Mitch from McConnell the, says the his job was to keep him from being reelected. Right. And I think that he worked to make sure that he accomplished nothing. And are, there's now the Republicans are saying that they are going to work to make sure what he has accomplished during his eight years is erased. Right. Um, Unbelievable. It's impossible to see, but w w would you assume that um, the historians will view the Obama administration in much the way you just described it? The, 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 well, they have to. I mean, the record speaks for itself. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, well, look, yeah. we're journalists here, and the record speaks for itself. I mean, unless, you know, I mean, when Trump says, uh, uh, make America great again, he, I, th I think he, again, though, I think that it is the empowerment of that white majority. And I think that it is not all about race. But if you say it is not about race at all, I think you missed the point. And you cannot understand what's going on. You cannot understand the GOP. You cannot understand the Democrats. You cannot understand this campaign. I absolutely agree with that. I mean, the, the, the race issue is enormous. Uh, I would say even a, a, a cornerstone of all, most of the things that, we, that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to talk anymore because we've run oh. out of time. Les, it's always good to have you here. Thank good. you so much. Well, good being here. Um, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. File this under bad news and worse news. Nearly one out of every five children in America is living in poverty. That is an absolute disgrace in a country in which the people at the top of the economic pyramid are enjoying riches that would have embarrassed King Midas. New York City's last mayor is worth 30 or 40 billion dollars. Bill Gates is worth 80 billion, and so on. And yet 20% of all American children are poor. The worst news is that nearly 40% of all black children are poor. For the first time since accurate records have been kept, the number of poor black children in the United States is higher than the number of poor white children, even though the black population is much smaller 
than that of whites. These are dreadful statistics, and the real-life stories behind the abstract numbers are often harrowing. We've got a presidential election underway in the United States, with celebrated names like Trump and Clinton and Bush in the news every day. Are they talking about child poverty in America? Do they have a plan to combat it, to ease some of the suffering that so many of these youngsters must endure each and every day? Maybe they do. Maybe they've been talking about it and I've just missed it. I can't believe that these wealthy candidates don't care about poor children. I'll have to pay closer attention. That's all for now. See you next time.